in these lectures uh, whenever we were talking about constraints we were imagining a surface over which particles are constrained to move but that's not the only way in which uh, constraints can arise there are several other uh, ways in which they can appear and one of the very familiar ones is um, what you see in a rigid body okay so in a rigid body the distances between the particles which constitute that body is fixed okay so that's a constraint um, a simpler version of that would be imagine two particles which are let's say connected by a thin rod okay and uh, the distance between these two particles always remains the same okay that, that rod is just to uh, make the visualization simpler so that is an example of a constraint so i'll take this um, this example and we'll calculate the virtual work okay and uh, we'll see that even though the forces on either of the particles does not give a non zero virtual work but if you consider the pair as a whole then the virtual work is zero okay so that's what we want to uh, see in this uh, video okay so let's exit the full screen and go here and somehow this should have been on keep on top okay okay so let's look the, at the example of let me remove animation timeline as well okay so we our example is so i have two point masses m1 and m2 okay and they are connected by a rigid massless rod okay the system is really the two particles the rod is just a fiction to help imagination okay so what's the constraint we have constraint is that let's look at um, the two particles m1 and m2 and the distance between them is let's say a okay so the constraint is that r1 so i'm saying with respect to some origin that you choose the location of this guy is r1 okay and the location of that guy is r2 so the constraint is r1 minus r2 that's this vector or you can say r2 minus r1 square that square gives you the length of uh, the separation between r1 and r2 is equal to a square or minus a square equals 0 okay that's your equation of constraint so if i want to write down in terms of phi which we had last time um the, the equation of constraint i would write the function phi of r1 and r2 there's no time dependence here so the distance is fixed you could imagine a another case in which the distance is changing with this with time in a specified manner that would also be a constraint a time dependent constraint but th um, this one is time independent so phi r1 r2 is r1 minus r2 square minus a square right now let's look at the differential of phi as we used to do earlier so d phi would be d of this quantity which will give you immediately 2 r1 minus r2 
dot d of r1 minus r2 which gives you dr1 minus dr2 right so our virtual displacement should satisfy so if i write d delta r1 and delta r2 as the virtual displacements as you already saw in previous videos that the virtual displacement has to satisfy um, instead of dr1 and dr2 i put delta r1 and delta r2 and equate the dphi to zero okay so this uh, becomes r1 minus r2 dot with delta r1 minus delta r2 okay and this um, this is what you should have as a uh, equal to zero right so that is the constraint you have on the virtual displacements okay so if you take delta r1 to be something the delta r2 is fixed by this relation okay that's good now let's find out the work done in a work in a virtual displacement okay so let's find out the virtual work okay so let's look at this uh, particles if r2 is pulling with force f1 then r2 is being pulled by the same force f1 but in the opposite direction okay so the force in 2 is minus f1 let's remove one there is no okay there is no need to put a one here so i'll just remove the one okay so the force on r1 is f the force on r2 is minus f okay that's um, that's the situation you have here and let's calculate the virtual work delta w or whatever you want to call it so the force is f on r1 it is getting displaced by delta r1 plus force on point 2 is minus f it's getting displaced by r2 which is you take out the f's common f dot delta r1 minus delta r2 i hope everything is fine till now now uh delta r1 minus delta r2 is constrained by this relation so i take this one and put in here okay that's what i do so this becomes f dot yeah before i do that let me uh, I, i jumped a little bit up to here it's good now let's look at the force the force is in this direction okay and what is this direction this is just the direction of r2 minus r1 right this is r2 this is r1 if you subtract that's the that's this vector so our force f okay that was fine here if you look at the force f that is something proportional to r2 minus r1 okay the proportionality will depend on the strength of the force but the direction is given by uh, this vector which i'm writing here right now okay now i substitute this fact in here in this okay and i get alpha times r2 minus r1 dot delta r1 minus delta r2 and i hope you have already realized that this is zero and this is zero because of this relation you see r1 minus r2 which is minus of r2 minus r1 and then the dot product of uh, dot product with these displacements that is zero okay so if you look at the forces in this system in pair then the virtual work done in any virtual displacement is zero 
Okay, so this is uh, another example that we know of now. And clearly, if you are looking at a rigid body, which is just a collection of particles whose distances are fixed, the same argument which I used here, uh, you can use there, make pairs, and you'll realize that immediately the virtual work done in any virtual displacement would be zero. Okay, that's good. We have now some familiarity with um, some other cases. Let's go to next, um, which I want to tell you. Okay, um, before I proceed further, let me um, uh, tell what kind of constraints will be considered in um, in this course. So we are going to restrict ourselves completely, completely to only some specific kinds and they are of the following nature. So whatever constraints you have, they should be, uh, we should be able to write them in the following form. So I should be able to write uh, the functional forms of them. So I should be able to specify, let's say you have k number of constraints. So I should be able to write phi one, R1, let's say you have n number of particles, Rn, and the constraint may depend on time, okay? Similarly, you will have total number of k, and I mean k independent. It should not happen that uh, the constraints are dependent on each other, okay? So they should be really independent constraints. And these are the only ones which we will uh, assume that they are present in this course. Okay. Now, if you have uh, such constraints, we say that the, uh, these are holonomic. Okay. So we say that the constraints are holonomic. If your constraints cannot be put in this form, meaning you cannot write down functions uh, specifying your constraints, then they are not holonomic, okay? There may be, di there are different kinds of non-holonomic constraints. We are not uh, bothered uh, with them. We will only restrict ourselves to these, okay? And note that I have allowed for time dependence in here. Okay, so time dependence is fine for us. Now, I'll, um, I'll tell you a little more about, um, what kind of constraints would be non-holonomic, at least one set. So let's take, let's say we are given these uh, k number of constraints, which means that my system now has 3n minus k degrees of freedom. Right? Because you have n number of particles which is clear because I'm using R1, R2, and Rn. So you have total n number of particles. Each of them has three because of X, Y, Z. And then I have specified K constraints for you. So you'll be able to eliminate K of them and you are left with three and minus K degrees of freedom. Okay. Now let's take the uh, differentials of uh, these K functions and write the differential forms. So if you look at f first one, phi one, I will be able to write d phi one, which will be zero, as the following, just just like what I did before. Maybe I, l let me introduce a slight notation before I write this. Uh, I want to, def so let's say you're given some function phi, which is a function of some vector r, which could be position vector, uh, then if I write del over del r, what I really mean by this notation is delta phi over delta x, delta phi over delta y, delta phi over delta z, and this must be very familiar to you. This is nothing but the gradient of phi, okay? And that's a very handy notation. So sometimes I'll use gradient of phi or sometimes I'll use del phi over del r. This notation you can find in, uh, for example, Landau Lifshitz or um, other books, some some of the books. Okay, 
so now if i want to write d5 i can utilize this notation which i told you just now so i have to take partial derivative with respect to all the coordinates so it becomes delta phi phi 1 okay delta phi 1 over delta r1 dr1 plus delta phi 1 so i'm looking at first constraint still delta r2 dr2 so there have to be dot products here right because you are dotting two vectors and delta phi over delta r n dr n and you will have a time derivative term as well let me write down maybe that also delta phi over delta t dt and this all should be equal to zero right now if i divide by um, dt i can write this also another relation which now um, constrains the velocity so delta phi 1 over delta r1 dot r1 dot so and so forth plus delta phi over delta r n r n dot plus delta phi over delta t n this is equal to zero okay so uh, that's fine but if i and, and um, if i want to turn these into virtual displacements and virtual velocities i will just drop this term you remember this is what we talked last time okay so these two you drop and your relation will become um, the constraint which virtual velocities and virtual displacements um, should satisfy okay that's one thing so let me write in shorthand um, your virtual displacements they satisfy delta phi over delta r i dot so now i'm using the notation which is for virtual uh, okay displacements and now i runs from 1 to n okay for all the particles and i put a label a because there are a number of constraints uh, a runs from 1 to k okay and for your virtual velocities we'll have summation delta phi a over delta r i into v i dot okay that's good now why am i interested in only holonomic constraints okay the reason is that if you have holonomic constraints okay I, I jumped a bit again um, i just should have made mo one more remark here so you see your um, constraints let's say you are not given constraints in the form of functions which i wrote which i wrote here okay let's say you are given constraints in the uh, in the differential form so you are given constraints in this manner okay so you are given k equations involving the differentials now if you are given uh, a set of constraints in the in the form of differentials it is not necessary that you will be able to integrate them and write them as functions so there may not exist integrating factors which will allow you to term, turn them into functions now if that is the case then your uh, constraints are not holonomic because we need um, them to be written in terms of functions okay so they will not be holonomic constraints and that is why um, uh, for your uh, constraints to be holonomic and if they are written in differential forms you should be able to find integrating factors which can turn these ones into these ones okay so let's say we are given holonomic constraints now why are 
we so much interested in holonomic constraints? The reason is simple. If I am given holonomic constraints, then I can eliminate the dependent ones, okay, and write down uh, or, or specify my system only using coordinates which are independent of each other. Which means, if I am given holonomic constraints, then I will move from R1 to Rn. I will not use them. Instead, I will use Q1, Q2, so forth, Q. How many? I'm saying the Qs are the independent coordinates. So you remember they are total of 3n minus k independent coordinates, okay? So let me call this set as, as Q, okay? So I'll be able to um, phrase my problem in terms of these independent coordinates and that is why I'm interested in holonomic constraints. If your uh, system is not holonomic, this you will not be able to write down. Okay, so now um, we are almost there to start writing down a very important principle, which is called uh, D'Alembert principle that will be the subject of next video. And from the D'Alembert principle, we will be able to write down a very nice form for the equations of motion. Okay, and what we have discussed here will be utilized there because you will uh, see that the system will be described using these independent coordinates, which are called generalized coordinates. And that's the plan for the next video. Okay, see you in the next video.